Okay, let's try this again without uh, screaming children as the background for our lecture. I just want to tie up a few of the issues about imperialism that I was talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, one of the points that I was making um, that I didn't really get a chance to expand on is that imperialism allows us to think through the materialist and idealistic range uh, renditions of history that have been a big theme of this course. We can view imperialism really through either lens and understand the driving forces either as more of a materialist impetus or as an idealist impetus. So on the material side, you look at imperialism as the product of a number of different technological shifts. So on the one hand, the new technologies that we are seeing means that imperial powers need access to particular raw materials that they had not needed before. In the early part of the 19th century, that might be rubber for tires, that might be tin or copper. In the latter part of the 19th century, that's more and more about oil. So that's one way that um, the technological shifts drive the move to the new imperialism. But the other thing that you see is that uh, military technology shifts and allows a greater um, projection of imperial force. So certainly they have more firepower in their armaments. Their ships are able to go up river because they are motorized instead of sailing ships. Um, their communication technology is better so they can administer their empires much more readily. And the thing to understand about this is that once these technologies start to drive imperialism, there's almost like a snowball effect, and they almost have to continue their imperial project in order to protect what they already have. And I'll give you an example of this that I think is really, really interesting. Um, India becomes basically the crown jewel of the British Empire. And in order to facilitate trade with India, the British um, support the building of the Suez Canal through Egypt, which makes at, uh, access to Indian trade that much easier. So the Suez Canal opens in 1867. But then once they have made their economy so contingent on that British Imperial India trade, they cannot lose access to the Suez Canal. That would absolutely wreck their economy. So. As a result, the British start to intervene more and more and more in domestic Egyptian politics as they are separating from the Ottoman Empire because they have to guarantee continued access to uh, to that Indian trade. So it's this really sort of interesting dynamic whereby the imperial project sort of has its own momentum and pushes them into greater and greater levels of conquest and occupation. So that's the uh, materialist argument or materialist narrative for understanding um, imperialism. But there's also the idealist side, that there is something here about a shift in the way that people think. And we have two different clusters of ways that people are thinking about their imperial project. Neither one of them is particularly great, but one is maybe a little more salutary than the other. So on the one side, we have the rather... Uh, aggressive, virulently racist notions um, that you saw in some of your readings for today. Carl Pearson talk of, talking about imperialism being justified by nature. There are these theorists who turn uh, Charles Darwin's ideas about competition between species and turn that to competition between races. And so in their view, imperialism is justified as an extractive measure because, frankly, one race has proven itself to be superior to the other. So that rhetoric is certainly out there. On the other hand, there is this rhetoric about bringing the benefits of European civilization uh, to the imperial territories. And this is a little bit self-serving. Nobody exactly asks the, the natives whether they really want the benefits of European civilization. But there is, I think, a need to take this seriously, that this isn't just a cover for extracting resources. For some people it is, but for others it is something that they really, really take seriously, that they believe that, well, trade is beneficial, European civilization is beneficial, and they want to bring the uh, imperial territories into that sort of mode. And the French, I think, in particular, are strong on this. Um, there's this rhetoric that goes around in uh, the French press in particular about the mission civilisatrice, the civilizing mission in France. And so a lot of the French territories are not really administered as colonies per se. They're administered much more like they are part of France. So if you're Algerian in a French territory, you could theoretically uh, work your way to getting French citizenship once you adopt French language, French manners, French customs, and all of the rest. So I'm not saying this to defend the imperial project, because again, this was not something that they were asking per se, but I think we have to accept that they took it seriously, that they saw that um, 
the Imperial Project could be mutually beneficial. And this is why I think that Joseph Chamberlain excerpt that you hopefully read for today is so important. He is arguing that their rule over these territories can only be justified if they are mutually beneficial. I don't know if he was fooling himself or if he was fooling his audience, but in any event, I think it's significant that they even need to make that sort of argument in the first place, that they need to justify their rule based on something more than just the survival of the fittest or the superiority of a particular race. Okay, so much like Victorianism, the Imperial Project has this ideology that is continuing over the course of the 19th century. But much like Victorianism, it is coming under more and more assault or more and more questioning. And there's a particular episode in uh, British imperial history that I want to talk about because it forms the background for the story that you're going to read for Thursday. And this is called the Sepoy Mutiny. And the Sepoys were um, Indian soldiers or native Indian soldiers in the service of various British armies in India. And they were sort of like the model Indians, the people who were going to become British one day. Well, in the 1860s, there is a mutiny among a number of these different troops, a number of these different regiments. And the supposed cause of this mutiny was that the British army had introduced a new type of rifle that had an oil cartridge that you had to bite off before putting it into your gun. And the oil on the cartridge, the rumor goes around the barracks, that it is not in fact oil, but it's animal fat. And the Muslim soldiers came to believe that it was pork fat. The Indian soldiers came to believe that it was beef fat. And both of them then came to believe that the British occupiers were essentially forcing them to violate the laws of their religions through service in the army. So a very strange thing to touch off a revolt. And most have concluded that, in fact, that's sort of the immediate spark. But obviously, there, there are much greater issues um, uh, underlying this revolt. So it's a tremendously uh, conflicted time. There is ma are mass amounts of violence on both sides, and it's a really, really ugly situation. And we have this slide. Um, if you look at your slides, you'll see one example of the sort of depiction that we have in the British press. These almost demonic Indians rising up uh, and threatening the virtue of a good white English woman. So there is that narrative out there. But on the other hand, there really is uh, a sense of a reckoning, a sense of a, a re-questioning of the imperial project. And more and more people are starting to say, we need to do this right. We need to actually administer these territories well. So in the wake of the Sepoy Mutiny, over the last several decades of the 19th century, the British are putting renewed emphasis on their imperial project, not just about extracting resources, but about, about providing some sort of good governance, education, infrastructure, uh, and in many ways, making India a better place to live, and maybe even potentially thinking about transferring it back to the natives at some point. Point. So again, like Victorianism, I want to underscore that imperialism is not just this dominant ideology, but in fact, as it, we get farther and farther into the 19th century, there is more and more of an attempt to question this. And so the last uh, excerpt that you read was from Hobson, Imperialism, <coughs> Uh, a critique of imperialism. And if you read that, he is arguing against it from a Marxist perspective. So this is after 30 years or so, whereby the British have tried to make their rule in India somewhat better, somewhat more humane, and he is arguing that it's still not working. And if you read that in conjunction with the other sorts of articles that we have there, we see more and more complaints that the problem is not just that imperialism is being done wrong, it's that it can't be done right at all. Um, certainly, Meinert's Hawkins' uh, adventures in, um, in Africa show some of the, the brutality there. The most horrible, horrible uh, notorious episode from the imperial period uh, is Leopold II, the king of Belgium, and the horrible things that he does in the Congo. You have a, a horrific description there, and there are a few slides to accompany it if you'd want to know. Um, point being, when Leopold's uh, crimes come to light, they are so notorious that he is, in fact, driven from the throne in 1902, I think it is. So the point being that as we are in this latter part of the 19th century and into the early days of the 20th century, people are not taking imperialism for granted anymore. They really are questioning it and trying to figure out if there is some way that they can make it work or if, in fact, they need to give up on it entirely.